Hello everyone, welcome to Heart's Happiness Podcast. The place where I, Manpreet, share my journey of healing intergenerational family trauma to help you to understand your story. I share a bunch of tools and tips that will transform your mental health and allow you to find your own heart's happiness. So exciting, right? Each episode will cover one of three areas. One, raising awareness of what this trauma actually is and how it hides in our lives. Two, tools, tips, support, lots of different things that I've used to get better and heal from this trauma. And three, I'll be connecting you with so many specialists and therapists and coaches as guests on my show. So we are going to transform your mental health and empower you to take your healing by the hands and move forward. Hello, my loves. Welcome back for another episode of Heart's Happiness. I am finally doing a guest episode. I'm doing a few this month. So I have somebody coming on today sharing her journey of healing from trauma, addiction, and transforming that, transforming her life for her children. It's a really inspiring story. I'm really excited to introduce her in just a moment. And this whole month, actually, I'm going deep into childhood trauma and how we can move past that. And I have a very special class for you all, which is completely free on Wednesday, the 21st of February at 6 p.m. It's called The Empowered Adult, How to Finally Release Childhood Pain and Thrive Today Without Excusing the Past. So after healing myself from complex trauma for like nine years and over the last three years helping clients on their healing journeys, I've learned so much that I have to share with you because I think people that are on a healing journey sometimes get really overwhelmed. They burn themselves out with it. They don't know what to do. They lack support. They're trying to do it all on their own and they get lost and in the pain of it, in the darkness of it, because some of us are really overcoming horrendous things like abuse that's just been awful. And because it was in that beginning part of our lives, it's just feels so impossible to come out of. But I have those steps to really help you and I want to help as many people as possible to really like end this pattern, this generational curse, this generational trauma that's in your family, this thing that's blocking your happiness, your peace, your health. It does not have to be that way at all. And I totally understand because I was exactly the same when I didn't want to live and I felt like life was failing me. I felt that I was unlucky. And actually the healing journey is what brought gave me back all of that power so I could help my younger self and really change my story. So I'm going to leave the link in the episode notes. You can also just email me if you've got any questions at manpri at heartshappiness.co.uk or you can just message me on Instagram if you've got any questions. But it's free, it's going to be 90 minutes, and you can watch the replay. So if 6pm UK time doesn't work for you in your time zone, do not worry, you can still sign up, okay? So I'm going to pop that all in the episode notes, and now I'm going to pass you over to my wonderful guest. Hello, my love, welcome to the podcast. Did you want to introduce yourself and explain what it is that you do? Hi, okay, so my name's Alicia. I'm a generational curses coach. My business is Unleash Your Healing Vibes. Um, I got the idea to become a coach when I overcame addiction uh, and a couple of other things. I was in a couple of domestic violent relationships and I realized that I had codependency. And then I later realized that a lot of these were generational traumas or actually curses that had been passed through my epigenetics. I studied psychology in college, um, but I never really wanted to be a therapist. It just wasn't for me, too formal. But once I learned about life coaching, I thought that's that's where I belong. That's more my passion. So I thought I would like to help other people who feel like maybe they're the black sheep of the family and that they have uh, went through some things like I have other generational curses because I feel like I was born to do that. Um, And so part of my spiritual journey has been to try to help others do the same thing. Love it. Great. So we're going to have a great chat today because there's lots of similarities. And you found my work through Tiny Buddha, right? So like an article that resonated with you. And yeah, like, so we've had, not that I know the details of your story yet, but that you've got, you found some similarities. And I guess we're kind of doing the same thing. And I love that you call it a generational curse. Because I was literally saying that the other day about my family. Like some people say it's 
like my family karma, which isn't shit, by the way. <laughs> like, <laughs> and like, um, you know, it's for me and my brother, we're breaking the family karma, but sometimes that can feel really heavy and just makes you feel really powerless. But it is a bit like a curse. Yeah. Um, yeah, to me, you know, because when I was little, I saw, especially like with alcohol addiction, I was like, oh, I don't want any part of that because I don't want to be so, you know, just mean. Yes. And then it turned out that that's exactly where I went. Um, but it it wasn't until I got like later that I realized it was unresolved trauma that was manifesting as the addiction, you know, that I just hadn't handled. Yes, yes. Well, you know, so and even me, like there was alcohol in my family and I, you know, really was adamant that I didn't want to become like an alcoholic. And I, de I definitely never really identified as one because I went to work, you know, I was highly functioning, but I had a really weird dependency with alcohol for um, disassociation, for moving away from my feelings. And I, I think I always will have a weird relationship with it, to be quite honest. Um, but it just looked different to the ones that I used to see around around me. And I think that's the thing about when you come from a family of addiction, that it can really play out in like different ways, which I'm sure we'll we'll talk about. So um, tell me a little bit about your story and how you found yourself in addiction, because like, you know, childhood generally, I know looking back, we can always go, oh, it's because of this now yeah. that you know everything. So tell us a little bit about your story and your healing journey. OK, so. Um, I started drinking when I was 14, which was a little young now that you look back, but you know, a lot of, I'm a, I'm from a small town, so it was kind of what we did. Um, but I really didn't consider it a problem like until way later when I looked back and seen that that's where things started. Um, but let's see, I was, both of my parents kind of left and my grandparents raised me and I never looked at it as like feelings of abandonment until I got older and read about it and was like, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I had some of that. Um, but then, so my grandparents raised me. And when I was 14, my grandpa got cancer. He had lung cancer. He was in the military. So, but um, then he lived for about a year. And so I watched him go from like really strong to really sick and just die. And it was really hard for me. I was a runner. I had to escape. So not only was I drinking to escape, but I stayed gone all the time, like at my boyfriend's house and just wherever I could be to not be in that environment. You know, looking back, I hate that I did that. But that was just, you know, a reaction. So how a you were dealing with your emotions, yeah, like not dealing. Right. I, well, there you were just doing dealing. the best you could, could with what you've been taught, right? So, and at the end of the day, your parents were runners too because they left. Yeah. So. And I didn't, you know, so I didn't really have any other uh, choice there. Well, then I went on to college and of course I was really smart. So like drinking, it never, I scheduled my classes around it so that I could drink, you know, so it never really interfered with my grades or anything too much because, you know, in college, you just needed to see. So, um, but then my great grandma got sick and she died, um, which was more like my grandma. So that was like three years later. And then I hadn't really healed from the first one, you know, and then I got into some trouble with the law a little bit later, you know, because I was drinking and doing drugs, lost my license. And then uh, my mom died, which even though she was 41, so she was super young and I never got to like, uh, you know, hang out with her or see her or speak to her. And you think maybe like as you get older, you will, because I do and did have a relationship with my dad later. Mm. so I think all of that on top of it I was you know I had just repressed all that stuff underneath the rug um it wasn't until I had a couple of kids and decided you know I had to get sober this was you know your Saturn return uh like when you turn 30 that's when I kind of realized I think that was like 2018 something is wrong this is not how I need to be living and so I finally got sober in 2020 and in there, I heard about codependency. They didn't really talk about codependency much when I was in college. Um, but then I found out that was like a relationship addiction. And it turns out that I had that too. Mm, well, codependency is often seen as the root cause of all addiction. Like it's the one underneath. Yeah. Well, and with me, I thought, you know, that the trauma, I think, is what led to that too, because I had like, 
kind of a trauma bond type relationship with my dad. As I got older, you know, we, we became like drinking buddies, but that's not really a great mother or, you know, father and daughter relationship style. Um, but I was just appreciative to have that because I'd lost so many family members. I was like, Hey, I'll, I'll take, just whatever, take whatever, whatever just to connect with you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so that's kind of how, um, I think I need, you need to, I needed to heal like trauma bonds too like with that I'd formed as a as a child with the people around me um mm -hmm. which I you know I did later yeah sure and how did um so obviously having so much loss as well as the abandonment from your parents did you notice and and you said like getting addicted to substances like to kind of deal with everything or not deal uh to avoid the emotions and how about because I really find that this can really play out in like our romantic relationships as well. Did you find that like with your kids' dads or, you know, like uh, did, were you going out with the same, like with your dad? Like I went out with my dad quite a few times or, you know, mm -hmm. like people like them. How did uh, it yeah. relationships? Um, Yeah. And I think that's when I realized it was kind of tendency because I was I, at the time I never wanted to be alone, which I've been alone now and I love it and it's so much better. But at the time I'd never done it. You know, I went from like a high school boyfriend to a college boyfriend to another boyfriend, which, you know, is who I had a kid with. And so I never took any time in between those to be by myself. And they were, um, the latter two were very like domestic violence and, you know, verbally abusive, all the abusives. Okay. So, you know, yeah, a similar, it was, um, I guess where my papa, he had died. So like he left me too. That's the way I looked at it. So it was kind of a being abandoned. So yeah, I wanted, uh, to replace that with people that I knew were going to leave too. You know what I mean? Like yeah. unconsciously, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, of course. And then when you've been through all the things that you have, you've got such low self-worth and low self-esteem that, cause I would be like a crumb of love was better than no love so yeah. it's almost like I was out there with my begging bowl for crumbs of love and then you are a magnet for the wrong ones basically right oh yeah and then yeah. When you are in abusive situations you know you're just so desperate for the crumb of love you accept things that maybe you know other people wouldn't because of that low self-esteem low, low self-worth and that's really shit place to be yeah well, and, uh, you know, it was kind of narcissistic, too, that that kind of relationship. So, like, they would start out with, you know, the love bombing and everything in the beginning. So, it was like I was constantly like, oh, he'll be better when he gets back to that beginning stage. And maybe not so bad if he wasn't drinking, you know, but it was never, never like that. Well, and you're right, I had no self-worth at all, you know. And I never really got to know myself, period. I'd always, like lived and did what everybody else wanted me to do my yeah. family had told me I was going to college I had to do this and that and the other and that's what I was doing mm -hmm. you know the only thing I got to do for myself was drink yeah so that was the great. only thing like, I had control away. yeah well and I had control yeah 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 I mean I'm I gotta say I love bit, I love a bit of disassociation <laughs> so I'm not gonna you know when you're a kid that's grown up with these really overwhelming emotions um and you don't know how to handle it. Like the shame, for example, the sadness, the grief, the anger, the loss, all of those things are so intense. And as a little person, you just cannot handle it. So as you get older, that's why so many of us that have experienced trauma come into addiction because it's a way to relieve that pain, right? Yeah, it was. I was always a escape like looking back as a little kid I read books all the time and I was always in my own like I was like Alice in Wonderland you know <laughs> I was always in my own little world so I thought I definitely was an escape artist from from the very beginning I, I try not to do that so much now but that mm -hmm. was definitely something I had to to face that because after the addiction um it was, I was, I would do the same thing like with working out, like with yoga, yoga really helped me, but I would get almost addicted to working out. I would yeah. do it too much. So I have to moderate everything I do. Yes. Yeah. I totally hear you. Like even when I start doing something that's good, like I love 
I love my job. I love what I do. And But then I got crazy with it and started to do it too much. And then it made me sick. So it's like anything, right? Because even work can be a way that you avoid yourself. Anything that starts to become a thing that you become obsessive with or controlling over can be a way to not feel a certain feeling. Like even spiritual, I've had lots of very like spiritual people that have worked a lot on themselves. So they're really good at meditating and they can go into that kind of 5D realm, but they're doing it so much. It's almost like an addiction to leave reality. So it's just like everything that you do. I, I love the saying, you know, even like too much of one vegetable would make, would become toxic in the body, right? So anything, too much of anything is bad. Even if it's like yoga or work you love or water, like if you drank too much water, that's not going to be good for you either. It's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It I'm, you know, and I, I'm now, I am kind of obsessed with being healthy and, and trying to get people to be healthy. But I've also learned that you can only do some, and you're right about the meditating thing too, because that, it's sometimes I have to ground myself. I go outside and just get barefoot and walk around because, yeah. uh, you know, staying up in those type of feelings is, a, is in itself, it's addicting too. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, um, when you've grown up in trauma, um, feeling grounded in the present moment can feel so intense because we've avoided that so much um, that we can run away from that. But actually that's where the true healing really happens is when we can feel present and feel le learn to feel safe in our lives right now because that's what I've had to do a lot of like somatic experiencing and work so that I'm able to go it is the 5th of February 2024 while I'm recording this with you and I'm safe there was a time when like I don't have any dangerous things around me anymore I have a healthy relationship I've created a good life but there would be times when I'd still be on like hyper vigilant mode in this life I've created for myself I'd be scanning I still even now I would notice myself I was at the sauna earlier today and I could notice myself over analyzing relationships in my life I've done that my whole life as somebody who's codependent so I'm over analyzing relationships where I've not had contact and I was like, that's so interesting. I'm in this moment. There's nothing to worry about. Yet I am, my brain is finding something for me to obsess over. And as a recovering codependent, obsessing over relationships, platonic, family, romantic, whatever they may be, is like my thing. <laughs> so it's just the, and that hasn't gone. And it's going, you know what, in this present moment, you're absolutely fine. It's not your job to scan for danger in every single relationship and that's the thing when you've had that programming as part of your childhood experience it's so wired into you that learning how to feel grounded and safe in your life right now takes real work and real practice right. yeah yeah um it, it definitely does uh I try to you know I can tell other people all day you know I you need to learn to be present you need to learn to stay in your body and but to do it yourself is a whole different a whole different ball game yes yeah it's so funny there's so I don't know if you do this but sometimes I'm like I think I need to coach myself for a little bit like so I will because I send my clients voice notes so I will send myself a voice note about like what's going on with me because I think you can be so good at like you said even noticing it in somebody else or noticing it in somebody else's behavior but kind of like miss it in your own so I have to have like little touch points throughout my day where I'm like just check in with your body check in with what's going on with your mind are you are you is the old traumatize you back in town or um are you okay and I think um it's a real it's learning to, uh, well practice it's just the practice of we were in you know in the old days in so much pain that we were in a practice of avoidance a, a practice of numbing a practice of running away and now we're trying to learn the practice of being present of living of being grounded of um you know, feeling a joy in life. Like every day a practice that I do is I'm finding the joy, the glimmer in every single day, not chasing some goal or chasing success or chasing anything, but having it right now. And that really helps me in my nervous system. But I have to remember to do it. So I have to have like some sort of like reminder on my phone to go scan for the joy because otherwise my brain so naturally will scan for the danger. Yeah. Oh, well, I do have a, a ritual in the mornings to do that because I want to feel happiness and joy. There's a song 
um, I think it's Pharrell Williams called Happy. Oh, yeah, it's I love like that. it's on the little kids movie. And so me, I mean, my kids even like it now. We play it every morning. <laughs> She's like, you're going to play the happy song before we start school because I homeschool. And I do. And you can almost see both of them dance and stuff and they get ready for their day. And so I try to remember to listen to the happy song and mimic them. And then I get ready for my day. But yeah. then throughout the day, you will veer off. I mean, it is sometimes hard to bring yourself back. But that's just a little cute ritual that I do in the morning. I love that. And then it's like a bit like an anchor, right? So you can bring the song in throughout the day if you're having a really bad day. And that's the other thing. Like, you're going to have bad days. I don't know if, like, when you become, when you do this work on yourself, you become quite sensitive. I think we were always sensitive because of the environments we grew up in. But, you know, when you start to help people to heal, I've become, like, even more intuitive and all of these things, which means the collective energy can really affect me. So sometimes I'm like, why am I so why am I so angry? <laughs> I don't, know, don't know where that's come from, which is why it's really important to ground and clear and be in your own energy as well, right? Yeah, just the other day I was just out. We were just in a crowd and I came home so drained and tired. And I know that's what it was, just walking through other people. I was just absorbing all their energy and it was a high energy place. But I was just so drained when I got home and I knew, you know, that's what it was just being out in public. You know, sometimes I have to completely ground back. I have little crystals, you know, here and there and I'll sage the house and stuff. So, yeah, I love you know, I have, speaking my language. Yeah. You have to, right? But I wonder, um, this is going back in time in a bit, because I've been really thinking about this about when I was little. And, you know, I think I was always quite a sensitive kid. So I could really feel into people's like energy when I was little. And I could see that like mum wasn't okay. Dad wasn't okay. I also live with my grandparents. They weren't okay. And just learning to be this good little performer for everybody to try and make them okay. So like even like what I do now with as my job, it's like I was doing that since I was very, very young. And I know that we like learn, you know, learn to be codependent to survive and all of that. But I do think some of this is part of us as well. Like maybe we're just like these little light workers always. But, you know, I don't know if you have that experience, especially if you're sensitive, like if you had that in, from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's it's it's a bless. Like, it's a great thing to have. But it's also kind of a curse when you're little. You really don't know. But you're right. It was a, I was like a perfectionist. Like I thought, well, I'll just make super good grades and everybody will be happy when I get home. You know, it was up to me yeah. to fix everybody's problems. Yeah. Um, but that's not accurate at all. It just caused unnecessary stress. But uh, I think that's a, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard when you do that. But yeah, I definitely remember being like that when I was little. Yeah. Yeah. It's just trying to make people happy because again, it's just a survival strategy right like of if the adults around me are happy then you know I'm safe and also like when my mum and dad were happier they would be more like sometimes they were able to connect with me and give me love and it was when they and I could tell it was when they were in a better mood so it was like I was trying to do whatever I could to make them in a better mood so that I could get that love and connection from them never realizing that actually they've just got their own traumas and their own pains and um and and it's mad how that habit that you learned from childhood is something that you still are living as an adult and even when we've done like therapy or like you know all the different things to get better like it still comes right to the house I'm like oh it's just codependent again then oh great <laughs> it's just happened again I'm just people pleasing or feeling like I have I'm responsible for everybody's feelings or I'm responsible for all of my relationships or I'm responsible for everyone to be happy and all of those things like it and we're not right yeah uh, uh well and I still do that with the kids too and you know sometimes as a parent, you think it is your responsibility but they're not going to be happy all the time either so I have to remember you know and like that's just like my little girl's personality is different than my boy. He's happy all the time and she gets more upset over things, but that's just her personality. So sometimes it's really difficult for me not to want to come in and fix it all. Um, but I need also, to let it's her, okay go for her to be sad. Right. And it's okay for her yeah. to be angry. Like they're just, right. she needs that. Just emotions. Yeah. Just because you learned to turn them off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. and that's the thing as well. Like, it's not your job to fix her emotions. And actually as a parent, 
you know it's like giving giving your children the tools to be able to deal with the uncomfortable emotions and be able to hold the space and the capacity for the good ones and like for example I never knew how to deal with anger or shame or sadness or fear all I knew was that felt horrible and scary and I had to escape my body whereas now as like a 42 year old I, you know and my journey I've had to learn and I teach my clients this is what you do with anger this is what you do with grief this is what you do with sadness but if somebody had just taught me that when I was younger that would have saved me a lot of, <laughs> a lot of um you know pain but it's such I can't I can't believe that we don't learn these things actually even as part of our education like how to deal with our emotions it it kind of blows my mind a little bit yeah, well, I, I that's on purpose. They don't want, I mean, you know, I don't think anybody wants anybody to be able to do that because people who can think and they're not, and they're able to handle their emotions are much stronger. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. they're less controllable. So yes. uh, that's kind of why we don't uh, partake with our public school system here. Uh, yeah, and, I love that. I can <laughs> see why. Yeah. I can see why, like, you know, and um, I'm not a parent yet, but it really concerns me. Like, I feel like, um, you know, even this path I've taken to be an entrepreneur and stuff like that, uh, and just progressing on my own journey of personal growth, there's so much deconditioning of, like, society that you have to, to get rid of. It's not just the trauma and the things that you've been through. It's all of the crap that you've taken from, like, that collective thinking from the world, which, like you said, you learned from school. Like, we were just programmed. You just get go to college, get an, a, uh, get get your education and just do a shit job and die. Like, it's pretty much that, isn't it? And be okay with not being paid very well. And, like, everybody's doing it. Everybody's unhappy. I was just at the gym and I was in the sauna. I had to really protect my energy, but everybody was in there just moaning about money and about life and about... And I'm just, it, it's such a sad state of affairs that this is what societies, governments and et cetera say is what life's all about when actually it's about so much more. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's, it's sad. Um, and so that's why I'd like to, like, you like you said with the entrepreneur, that's something that's definitely not discussed or, you know, talked. And that's one of the biggest things I want to teach because I think, for a good future that's what we need more of we need more people to work and do and be creative and inventive because like the systems in place right now they're not working no you know they're completely broken and I would like to be a part of that's one of my goals myself is just to be a part of changing and bringing on you know how they say like the new earth or whatever yeah I would love to see a big nice great planet where everybody gets along and works and in harmony and has good food to eat and nice good clean water to drink and like live like we did in our in the ancestors did you know like off the yeah. land so and no like that, competition or jealousy yeah. or there's enough to go around for everybody or you know just all of that the ego stuff that sort of takes over and takes over the world and creates like wars and havoc and and all of those things generate trauma I mean like in your generation in your family's um background what wh where is where is your family from like what's your story because often there's trauma based in the history that's come through and then like you see it in the abandonment or the addiction and all that kind of stuff what's your family's history um well uh I'm trying to think now there's like Scottish Irish on my mom's side but yes. on my on my dad's side, there was um, Native Americans in my ancestry. No so, yeah, you know, they definitely were mistreated. Oh, my God, so much <laughs> I watched that film recently. Oh, gosh, it, is it called The Flowers of... Um, it's about Native Americans. It's so good, and it's about... It's a true story, actually, about how the Native Americans were treated with their land. Oh, it's so bad. Um, yeah, so they're definitely, without a doubt, so you've got trauma there. The Irish have got so much trauma. It's They're like... <laughs> like they're like us like the Indians um as in like you know we're a different type of Indians but you know there's so much because that's the thing when you start getting into people's family lines you start to see where the wars happened where you know the genocide happened you start to see it in our stories and how nobody really dealt with it so that's why it kept going on and on and on until you're the cycle breaker, the brave one that chose to go enough is enough. Like, what was the thing that really, like, you're in these abusive relationships, you've got your your babies, um, you're in addiction. What was the 
the breaking point for you to go, I need to do something else? Like, what was the thing that pushed you out of it? Well, the government got involved. So at that point, I it was either go to rehab or lose my kids. And so it was a yeah. rock bottom wake up call, but it's what I needed, um, you know, for that to happen. And it, I had been, like I said, it had been a couple of years and I'd been fighting it, but I just could not seem to break completely away. But they went to my grandma who, you know, she raised me, but now she's in her 70s. She's not going to be able to raise them. So I thought, well, this is it, you know, and so I had to do different and I'm super blessed. But I, what I did is I surrendered just straight down and I was like, look, I don't even want to, you just use me as a body and do what I'm supposed to do because I am at a complete loss. I'm done trying to be in control and everything just started to play out like it should. And I, everything was doing good. And um, like with my writing, I got a really good writing job. So I got to stay home with the kids from the beginning before I even decided to be a coach. So it seemed like once I gave up that control, I got things that were just kind of handed to me that oh, were so awesome cute. that I could like that I couldn't have even thought of, you know, at yeah. two or three years ago that I'd be working on my own at home, helping other people would have, I would have been like, no, you're crazy. But you know, it's, yeah. it's reality now. So amazing so when you surrendered but it sounds like you did to the process and so did you go to like when you said you went did you go rehab did you do like aa like groups or anything like that or did you just give up how was it well I went to a a long-term treatment like with because with alcohol they had told me my body was like an 80 year old who'd been drinking forever because I drank so much I I had like hallucinations I mean it was pretty bad I love my granddad. That's what he was like back in, back in the day. Yeah. Well, that's what they said it was like. And so the, I really had to. I mean, my health was declining. Um, But I went to a, a facility and then I went on to like a long term and I was gone for about four months. Wow. And um, but then I, I came guess back. You're detoxing in that period, right? So you're just really coming off everything. Which yeah, is in the beginning. Hard, right. Yeah. Really hard. Yeah. Because it's yeah, well, so, well, like, you know, my 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 relationship with alcohol, it's been like, oh, I'll give up from it. Oh, well, it's a bit like that. But you're just like, you had to really slowly bring it out of your body. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. And I, well, and there, you have to make the decision in the very beginning that you can't drink ever. And that was really hard um, at first. So I, I really, I wrote like a letter, like you would to an ex boyfriend, you know, like saying goodbye and letting go. And I did that for alcohol. Yeah, and then like set it on because it's been like a friend to you like for me like alcohol was like a friend it was somewhere I could go um to drown my like be sad or be lonely or you know it was it did provide some kind of support so it's understandable it was like letting go of a relationship I would imagine yeah. like a long-term relationship <laughs> you know because alcohol was kind of my first love or at least maybe second you know and it had definitely been there longer than anybody else yeah wow so so you went through the detox process in the in the facility and then afterwards um did you carry on with any kind of support or were you able to just go cold turkey or no well um um, I did the four months like in the long term and they they do therapy and that's where I found out that I had codependency you know and they give you like a little thing about domestic abuse cycle which I now use it's a little circle and it's black and it shows what domestic violence can be and not just physical like the sexual and the verbal and all of that and it was really good and it was like an eye-opener I'm like that's why I use it now because some things that you don't realize like gaslighting and all that you don't realize at the time that that is still abuse it's a cycle of abuse you have to look into that little cycle you can find it online Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was what like woke me up with that. Um, but then after I got home, I did I did like a phone call. This was like right before COVID. So they had all the Zoom things then. So I I just did like phone call therapy for about six months. But then after that I didn't do anything else, um, like leaving the house. Um, I got my license back, so I took a DUI class, you know, and I started building my life back you know and getting things back which did take a minute yeah yeah well I mean you've done pretty well you just went sober four years ago 
So you did that and then you've got like a whole new job and you um, and also not only, you know, I, I know when I started to like, oh, I've got loads of trauma in my life and this is why I've been acting crazy and this is why I've been doing all these things. It's quite a lot to get your head around and then you sort of start to feel, I don't know about you, but I really felt drawn to why am I doing this? So like to books and to podcasts and to, you know, like webinars and trainings and you start to get immersed in the world of like, finding out the information and the answers. I don't know if you, even though you weren't having therapy, if you were starting to find the, your own things that would help support you. Yeah, um, I came across uh, a lot of stuff about like light workers and like star seeds and empaths. And then I, I got into Reiki and yeah. um, I loved it. So um, this was just a, before I took it myself and learned how to do it. I was just listening to like guided meditations and I'm like, this is awesome. So I dove into it head first and then I found sound healing, which oh, is even awesome. just as cool. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you didn't know any of this stuff existed, but of course it makes sense. Everything's a frequency, everything's vibration. Like it all made so much sense. So then I dove into a bunch of webinars after that and I still get, you know, emails for a ton of them and I watch them. Um, I spent a lot of time watching webinars, even to this day, because you just learn so much and it all started adding together. But then I got tools to to do this and then to use, you know, with my clients too. that because my biggest thing was self-care. And I feel like a self-care preacher. I'm always preaching that to everybody. Like you yeah, have to have self-care. Everything, isn't it? It's everything because you didn't have any before. And that's why you didn't love yourself. You didn't take care of yourself. And that's why everything was falling apart. But now you've got that foundation and, and like simple things like sound healing, like doing a guided meditation, like eating in a way that's good for your body, like going for a walk. It's so nourishing um, and it's such an important and connecting with yourself and your own heart as well. Like, again, nothing that you learn as a child. So you had to learn those tools and, and and they really are everything. I feel like every one of us that's a coach or a mentor, we're trying to teach people how to love themselves. Right. Yeah. And yeah, and eating healthy, it, it really starts, I think, with your physical body, um, you know, because you have all these other, you know, the mental body and the emotional body and the spiritual body are really important. But I feel like if your physical body is like off balance, because mine was, I was eating horrible, you know, processed food and, and stuff and drinking pop. And so once I switched to taking care of that and started drinking like distilled water and I'm a vegetarian now. And, you know, taking some supplements and vitamins that sometimes aren't in our foods, that kind of stuff, I could tell a difference. My body felt good. And like you said, you hadn't paid attention to your body, really, because you were escaping it. I was too, you know, so paint, giving your body love was and doing exercise, you know, and yoga and Qigong. Those are my two favorites. I love Qigong. I um, love it. Well, this is a thing that for me, it's been a bit back, back to front because I feel like I um did loads of work like spiritually mentally emotionally and my physical body was the lot the last thing that I've been healing um so I did it kind of like the other way around especially because I was such a body and I have got so much trauma related to my body because of the way people spoke about you know just lots of bad things and um and I've really discovered now that if I had started with eating healthier taking care of it my body has been dealing with all of the emotional things I've been throwing at it and then having to deal with all the toxins I had in my body as well. Whereas like recently, if I have sugar, the, the level of anxiety that I have, the level of like crazy mental thoughts I'm having compared to the days where I'm not having that, I'm having like organic food. Like I can really tell the difference when I'm feeding my body the good stuff and when I'm feeding my, because I let myself have it, have it all, but I, I really take into consideration now what it feels like. And the years where I was having like a lot of um, like trauma therapy, I was doing a lot of somatic therapy. I had a lot of memories coming up. And um, so what happened was it was really bad. I hated it. It was bringing back childhood memories. So I'd have a drink of alcohol or, I, or I'd have sugar. I'd have my vices to, to escape my body. But actually that was putting more pressure on the body to like, so it was struggling to release it. And now I'm doing all of these like physical therapies to help my body to really let go and nourish it. But really, if you start that. So when I teach other people, I'm like, if you start with the body and you start with eating well, 
and taking care of yourself and moving and then build like your mindset and body practices on top and then build boundaries, then build like obviously taking out your your sabotages. That's the way that when I teach people, that's the way I like to teach it, but that's not the way I did it. I kind of did it a bit back to front. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I don't know that I started with my physical body either. I, I feel like I might have done like you did a little bit more in like spiritual and emotional, but it is the way I, I preach it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it makes it easier. Like, oh, yeah. Now, I don't know if you do this, but I'm, also, I'm like, what have you been eating? <laughs> That's my question. And where are you in your cycle? That's the other thing. Like, I've realized that hormones are in alignment with their bodies is also really stressful on the body as well. So that, and like you said, supplementation, that is huge. There could be like real vitamins that you're not having that's making your mind go crazy. Like here we don't have a lot of sunlight, especially in the winter months. So the lack of vitamin T D just generally makes us crazy, to be quite yeah. honest. Like it's a real yeah. problem. Yeah. Well, and um there's a lot of endocrine disruptors in stuff too. Um, you yeah. know, that like with water bottles, they were finding out with like uh like microplastics and endo endocrine disruptors, which you know, they mess with your hormones. Um but I found simply adding magnesium. So many people are magnesium deficient. I love the spray. I've got like an organic spray. So oh, cool. I've seen that. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff, right? But it really helps mental health, sleep. All of it. Nervous system, yeah. right? Yeah, you're well, and it's all tied together. A lot of people don't realize that your nervous system is, you know, because that's where your the fight or flight and everything was and it it was on for like ever, you know, especially when you have trauma, it's just like the button is turned on and it never turns off. Yeah. And for for those of us that had it from the womb, which I don't know about you, but without a doubt, my mom definitely had a lot of stress when she was carrying me. So we've had it straight away from the moment of creation. So that's why it's really can feel like we're pushing against something that's so innately part of us. But when, like you said, when, when we bring all these parts, that like holistic approach, when we're bringing our body, when we're bringing our mindset. And like you said, um, I've, I've done a few podcasts on exactly that, that going non-toxic and how that can really support your healing journey as well. So, um, you know, and not bringing those things into your environment because it does affect like your mental well-being and your, your up and down of your hormones. And what's happened with me is... Of lots of trauma lots of not being able to say no lots of like carrying a lot of emotions in my organs so I've actually like if you if when I've had blood tests it shows like the autoimmune so my body has basically started to attack itself because of you know being horrible to myself and also allowing other people to attack me and that's really common for those of us that have been very codependent have not learned how to voice our anger so it can start to, you know, attack ourselves. So then, you know, not only are, are we dealing with the trauma in our body, but also our body's having to fight off all the toxins that are in all of these things that are in our world, which are literally everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, and trauma itself can get stuck in specific areas of the body. It's not just in your emotional and spiritual body, but like you said, your organs. I mean, certain areas like the liver, people's liver get you know just deals with anger. emotions yeah and and so and, it goes. yeah and so I think a, a, a good liver cleanse is a really good idea too for almost anybody because uh they're just it, your liver's busy you know it removes like you said all the toxins but it also has to deal with all these un, un you know felt emotions that that we don't yeah we just don't and then it's just stuck in there causing problems which is what it's been doing for me and my body of late <laughs> but, um, I now just I always tell my clients this because it makes me sound crazy but I talk to my liver I also talk to my gut as well so I talk to my liver about uh, literally in the bath I'll be like what are you angry about <laughs> what would you like to tell me and then I speak to my gut about what emotions are you holding on to what shame are you holding on to what guilt so those are the two big ones and then it can affect our digestion it can affect um the releasing of toxins it can relate affect us disease in the body right because we're holding on to things and for those of us that have been very codependent that have been really taking a lot of other people's emotions have also been suppressing our own emotions our own anger 
it will be stuffed in your cells. So that's when the health, the health problems can start. So, you know, don't ignore them because it's the way that your body's communicating with you, right? Yeah. Well, and I, I think it gets stuck like even in the like the fascia, like the stuff in between. So I like there that's why I like a lot of qigong. If you do certain areas, um, you know, with that you can kind of work with the energy in those specific areas and I like what you said like talk to your um, organs because you really like just thanking it. it's just the vibration of being grateful and, and thanking your body that helps yeah yeah and just um you know and that's why I love somatic practices because it's helpful to let your cells know that we're safe now because your body doesn't actually know we're safe now it's still like caught up in all the drama from the nervous system etc but it just needs to know that it's okay and it knows that you're okay because you're not trying to escape with alcohol or for me when I was like in a safe environment but I'm pushing like a crazy person in my job so it's like oh so we're, oh so we're still not safe you're chasing a different lion now yourself <laughs> like that was you are now traumatizing yourself sorry we didn't we didn't get that and that's the worst thing guys like you know, if anybody listening to this, our parents aren't doing it anymore. We are doing it to ourselves. You know, a lot of my clients, I don't know if you hear this a lot, so much self-shaming, so much like beating yourself up, so much like being abusive to yourself. So the people that cause you the trauma, that, that cause you the pain may not be part of your life anymore, but you're doing it to yourself. I don't know if, you know, when you let go of the abusive men that were in your life, um, like my dad, he's been gone for 16 years, but I swear to God, he's he can still beat me up in my head. Like he can still go for it in my mind. And I, I have to remind myself, I am doing that. He's not doing that to me and bring myself back into the moment. And that's that's a big one as well. So that's when we're doing that sort of more mental shift of like being really conscious of the way that you're speaking to yourself and 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 making that shift from that energy to self-compassion and love. So, you know, when we're talking about self-love, it's not it's the way that you feed your body. It's the way that you take care of your body. It's the way that you speak to yourself. It's the way that you lovingly notice that you've gone into that kind of voice of fear and choosing the voice of love as well. Well, and, and just compassion and non-judgment, you know, because a lot of the times I'll look at something and, you know, I try to have to stop myself. Don't say that you should do better and don't judge things because sometimes emotions will come up and they could be old emotions, like, and you don't know where they come from. But if you judge it, then, you know, it's going to go right back down. <laughs> so yeah. I try not to judge, you know, just self-compassion and not judgment. Yeah. And just like meeting them and just being like, all emotions are, you can say like, put your hand on your heart and just like, whatever you want to say, you just let it out. Whatever you're afraid of, rather than shovel it down or ignore it or pretend it doesn't exist or get yourself angry about it, just allow it to come. Because it's just... Once an emotion is kind of heard and felt, it really will just pass along. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think that's really important. And it took me a while, you know, to get to get to that stage where I was giving myself self compassion because I was all about the self care physically, you know, but it was the mental, you know, trying to live and it, like if you if I live from my heart instead of from my head, that's kind of a fight too. I have to I have to battle yeah, between my us. mind. Yeah. yeah and my heart my heart is like she know it knows so much better than my head does but my head and my ego are like wait a minute you gotta listen <laughs> yeah and because sometimes it can be really scary to like follow your heart and do the things that really fill you up and feel good and feel expansive because your mind is like well we don't know this this is gonna work like when I decided to give up my job um so I used to work for the corporate world. I used to work in the BB for the BBC. And like my heart was just like, it's time to quit. You've got to quit. You've got to set up, you set up your business. You've got to do this. My mind and my ego that just was not happy. And I've been chatting to my um, clients today. And there's a few of them that are at that process where they they want to leave. And they're just like, but I just want to know it's really safe. My mind needs to know it's really, really safe. But their heart absolutely knows that this is the thing for them. And, and I love what you said about how when you surrendered, um, and you really allowed yourself to go all in with the process, how the little miracles started to find you. And that's yeah. what happens when we follow our heart, but we're just too afraid. And even though me and you would teach that, I bet you still do it all the time. I still do it all the time where I'm like, oh God, I'm scared. I just want to follow my brain. Thanks. It's really, it can be so scary to follow that space, but that is where the magic really happens. 
Well, I constantly have to tell myself, like, worrying is a low vibration and you're trying to vibrate high. So try not to, you know, dwell in those lower vibrational states. And you can literally feel if you let go, if I let go of the fear and worry, I feel it just gone, you know, and I completely rise up. And so it's kind of a, if I put a, you know, like a vibrational standpoint on everything, then it's easier for me to try to get rid of it, you know, because I've got that. No, no, no. That's, it's not, I wouldn't say that they're negative or bad. They're just lower. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. And also they just make life less enjoyable, don't they? Like if yeah. we sit there and worry about all the things that go wrong, or we sit there and go, do you know what? Today I just choose to believe that everything's going to be okay. And if it isn't, I'll just deal with it. If we just give ourselves permission to not worry, the experience of the day that you're having is just going to be so much better than than if you worry. I mean, I have to say I am a recovering massive warrior. <laughs> like it's been part of my DNA. I mean, I was to say I was hypervigilant as a child is an understatement. So I was always assessing for danger. And my brain still does that to the day. And I, to the point that I actually laugh at myself now, like I'll be like, oh, oh, that's really, that's so funny that I was in like the sauna, the place where I love to worry the most, apparently, um, you know, and having these just random things that I'm worrying about, you know, just people, life, if this person does, like just honestly, the most random things. And it's like just almost catching yourself in the worry and being like, okay, I'm doing that thing. This is not a worry for today. And in this moment, which is just amazing. I'm missing it because my mind is going into that worrying, hypervigilance, fear-based thinking that it's been in, again, a habit of a lifetime. And um, it's, a, again, a, a massive practice to come into the present moment, which is why I love joy. Because if I go, okay, if I chose to to find joy in this moment instead of what to worry about, what's the experience? And the way that you live life in that moment is so different to when you live it through worry. Yeah, it, it it's challenging to, to be present, but it is a much better, you know, feeling. Yeah, for sure. And it can be challenging because for so many of us, it wasn't safe for us to be present. And we found ways to escape. Like I, I used to have a great, you know, you talked about, you know, you being able to escape. I was exactly the same. I used to write a lot as a child. I had very great fantasies being rescued and all of the things. And um, so it's great to be able to do that and to leave the world. But there's we, like, I'm old. So there's decades I've missed because of that. And now almost like, because I feel like I'm living life and I'm present, that I just want to get the most out of it in every way. And, you know, and yeah, that of course we can't stop bad things happening and sadness coming, but we can still, you know, enjoy, enjoy the ride, even when the bad stuff comes. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's just choosing how I respond to things instead of reacting. That's kind it's of a big, a huge one, yeah. isn't it? Try not to react, but more respond and take a step. And I'm big on like breathing exercises, maybe not the whole in the moment. You can't do some of those, but if you just take a deep breath, <laughs> Yeah, or just notice your breathing. Is it fast? Is it slow? Just even becoming aware, right? Or if you are even, sometimes you're just holding your breath. <laughs> yes, I do that a lot. <laughs> or you're shallow or, you know, you're just kind of weird. And, you know, like, well, I've, I've been doing yoga recently and just kind of even noticing, oh, this part of me is really tight. Or this part of me is, you know, looser than that part or there's more space on this side I feel like that's really interesting you know just even that like even when you're sitting down kind of tuning into your body and being like this side feels like that that is a great thing to do as well to bring you back into into the moment those kind of things that will get you out of that you know that sort of fight or flight mode of oh my god I must scan for danger I must scan for danger I mean this whole world is built on fear isn't it you know yeah out the world leaders so much of the world just running in their nervous system all of the time constantly in you know as if we are all at war all the time and if we all were like in that beautiful ventral vagal of our uh, polyvagal ladder as I like to call it if we were all in that all of the time this world will be that new earth for sure or if there was more of us anyway yeah well I, I think a lot of people are are starting to come out of their shell that way and um, wake up 
you know, to things because some of some of the narratives are just falling apart, you yeah. know, to be to be honest. So I, you know, I, I'm positive, and I think that's what we need people to do is just to be positive. You don't need to look out into the world like there's chaos at a lot of places, but is there chaos in your little home in your little area? Because you can make it just go outside and spend some time in nature for a little bit. You know, just you make your you create your own. And I think people forget that we can create our own destiny. We're we are the creators, you know, of our yeah. own life. For sure. And I guess you could you are a great example for someone that was rock bottom not even that long ago, like four years ago is not long at all. And this healing, this almost this ripple effect you've been creating for your children for the women or the men that you're helping and you're supporting and, and people will be watching your transformation that you are this person and that, like it's impossible not to see and the impact that that has is so beautiful as well like and if we all were doing that and creating that ripple effect it would be like super magical right yeah yeah and that's what I'm that's what I hope for you know if we can just help like 10 people and then those 10 people can help 10 people you know and even if it's just like passing by not everybody has to be a like in service for a career but they could just be talking to a stranger you know sometimes just like talking to somebody out on the street can make their day and they could be having a really really bad day and you could just have changed the path of their life you know so I think it definitely ripples out like like that like you said yeah, and I think, you know, lots of people might not be like coaches, but they might find right. something else that, you know, when I think when you're like taking care of yourself better, taking care of your body better, like taking care of your mind, you're taking care of your nervous system, you're breaking all of that generational curses, you're doing all of that, you start to want more for yourself in terms of career and like to be fulfilled. And then you're sitting more and more with it. So you're starting to hear the whispers of your soul that are like, maybe I could do this. So like I have, you know, a lot of my clients that have been healing, they then want to go on to help others. And then there's some of them that are not like coaches, mentors or anything like that. But I don't know, they, they've they always been great at marketing and selling. It was like their job for 100 years. And actually, they want to go on and help people like us to spread our message. So like they still in service, but maybe not in the same way that we are. But like that way, we can help so many people together, like I, I I never I mean I never knew that my podcast was going to lead me to to the work that I do now like at all I never knew that was going to happen um but now I even help my clients to go and help other people and that is like a real surprise too because it's just such a I realized being a codependent for ages when I was overworking I thought I had to help everybody but it's so nice and refreshing to know that actually I don't because there's loads of us and the way if I help you know, somebody help other people, then we get to help more people together. So again, it's it's not competition, it's collaboration. So even me and you, we we might have similar clients, right? And but I love having someone like you on my podcast and I will share like how people find you because people may resonate more with you because of what you've been through, because of your background, because of your stories, because you're a mom, because of the whole addiction thing. That is totally fine for me because I just want people to find the people that are, are their people to help them on their journey. And that's, I think that's, again, a, a different way of thinking than, you know, what the corporate world and, you know, what society even says to us, because there's enough for everybody and we all get to be part of that great healing kind of ripple effect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, you know, everybody deserves to have a good life and not <laughs> just the top 1% or whatever. Yes. And like, that might be their game, but that's not the game I want to play. So, no, you know. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And, we, and we can all have that as well. Um, I was meant to ask you this ages ago, and I know I'm getting to the end of the podcast, but tell me a little bit more about generational curses. Like, so how you see that with clients? How how do you help people with that? Okay, so, um, well, I compare generational curses with generational trauma because it's kind of the same thing, but people look at it differently. Um, so like you said, with, with, there was actually a study, I think her name was Rachel Yehuda who did it. Um, but there's a bunch since then, but she was studying like, um, there was victims that had been through the Holocaust, um, and then the DNA of their children and how they were, they actually found, um, a gene that was different that had been 
that it was kind of like responding to the stress environment in the uterus that had changed. So there, they were, um, you know, that they could prove that the trauma was actually genetic mm. and that it had passed on. Well, and then of course curses. So you hear about generational curses in um, like mythology and ancient texts, Bible, Hindu, everybody has their stories yeah, yeah, of definitely. that. And um, so when I looked at my family, you know, they had addiction and on both sides. And then I went back and I asked some more and there was addiction and then there was codependency. And then there was like issues with like the men, the men in the family all seemed to gravitate to a certain type of woman. And the woman always seemed to gravitate to a certain type of men. And I decided, you know, this was my, I was here to break that. And I feel like I guarantee there's other people out there who feel like their job is to break those curses too. Um, because you don't just break it for yourself and your future generations. I feel like you break it for your ancestors and even the ones who aren't here. Yeah, I feel like you, you, you know, and they're there helping could be everyone to heal. They don't they say like three, is it three or four generations back and forwards? Like it's when you get yeah. like a cycle breaker, it does, ju- you know, it will break that for everybody. So it's good for everybody concerned, even though it doesn't always feel like that when you're on the human side and not everybody's doing it. <laughs> that doesn't always feel like it. Right. But it is a, it, you know, I definitely feel like I am that one in my family. And sometimes I feel like an utter alien because they're not doing it. <laughs> so like the rest of my family are not doing it. And they just look at me like I'm an absolute weirdo. So, um, but, you know, that's fine. Because in some way, something will will go into their heads and they'll think about things in a different way. But it's such a beautiful thing to be able to do and like to be brave enough to do it, right? Like you had to like face, like we, you had to really face yourself in that mirror and all of that shadow, right? Like the part of you that drank, the part of you that was choosing that life, like to really face like your sabotage and that darkness of your shadow, like it's it's hard. Like I I am up up close and personal with my shadow at times. Like I'm like, oh great, you're you're back because <laughs> you're never gone anyway. So thanks for coming back to town. Um, and it's like not having, but just kind of going, oh okay, this is interest. Sometimes I'll see a different side of my shadow that I haven't seen before. Like the working thing has been really interesting because that's been very new for me. And just going, oh, my God, there's a real shadow aspect to this. That Now I have some awareness. I can change those behaviors. But, yeah, it's not like an easy thing. But the results, like seeing your children, like I'm sure they pick up on the things that you do and the way that you think. And then you're like, oh, my God, I'm planting seeds here with these kids. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, because, you know, like I even have um... – like yoga, I, you know, I've got my little girl, she does yoga, she doesn't do it every day, and sometimes she, you know, frowns when that's gym, why can't we go outside and do something different, but she's starting to have, like, see the, uh, the physiological effects of it, like, she's like, you know what, mom, I really do feel really good after doing yoga, and I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, mom's you. not just, <laughs> I'm not just telling you things to be mean, this is, this is actually beneficial, and so hopefully, you know, they carry these things on into their life, and they'll have a better tool because you know they're going to be faced with some of the same even if I control the environment now I'm not going to be able to control their world when they get out into it no no, exactly and they need the tools to be able to deal with it because society and the world as a is going to still be the way that it is and they need to be able to deal with the negative side of things and still be able to survive otherwise you're just controlling them in that environment right and that's it so but it's still a great thing to give them that we didn't have right and we had to go and find at uh, later yeah. on. so it's matter because I you know I feel not not any of my clients but I do hear from other people that you know creating a business when you're a mom healing when your mom is so difficult but you're somebody that was doing that and releasing an addiction so it's totally possible right any tips yeah. for that well and um I'm a single mom too, so I don't really yes. have any help uh, or anything, but I have, uh, I don't share them, you know, so he's not around. Um, but I think, okay, yeah, tips would be like, if you are a mom and you're trying to do things like that, if you can work from home, that really helps because you can kind of work on your own time. 
especially like with me, I have uh, a morning. You got to get up a couple hours before they do. Yes. Just so that you can bring, get yourself centered and do your daily rituals. Um, and then in the evenings, you may have to stay up a couple hours longer too, because you can't always work throughout the day. Like just like yesterday, it was really nice and they wanted to go outside. So I had to put aside my work and go outside with them for an hour. Um, you have to create a work life balance, which is difficult. Like you said, sometimes you just want to work all the time. Um, it's, okay. it's still, still challenging for me to, to find a work life balance. And then of course I also, I'm homeschooling. So, you know, it's, it's really hard sometimes, but we do it, you know, and some days you just have to change the schedule up a bit is all, you know, yeah, it just makes yeah. it more, makes it more lively. Yeah, I bet. I, I know I was talking with one of my clients the other day and we were talking even about having boundaries with our kids so that she could take care of herself. So, for example, we were talking about how, you know, saying a certain time where everybody has to be in their rooms, like whether they're reading or having downtime so she can start to have her downtime a little bit earlier so even that like it's okay to teach your kids something like that because it's really good for them to see a mother model it because you know for a lot of us we didn't see our mums ever do any form of self-care or prioritization whatsoever which is why women find it so hard especially with their children like the guilt and shame of putting themselves ahead of them is like it can be so painful because again, we've never been shown and like it's breaking a cycle just doing that. So well done, Lewin. you're an inspiration and you're helping people. So how do people find you if they want to work with you? I will put anything that you share in the episode notes as well. Okay. Um. So my website is unleashyourhealingvibes.com. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and my podcast is of the same name but you can find the podcast from the website Fabulous. and they can go there and just, you can reach out to me um, through there, through the email thing. Amazing. It's so wonderful feeling yourself. And now do you find that you're attracting women's or men similar to you and your story or just like different people? Like it's so interesting to see who you attract, right? Cause I find this really interesting. Like it will be like little elements of my story, but so many different backgrounds and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Usually um, a lot of, like a lot of my clients have had the addiction. Um, but then there was a couple that re saw codependency and they were like, Ooh, so, um, but, and then I had the one client who, who had the hoarding and like letting go of, of stuff problem yeah. that had just passed along. But what was, you know, it's funny because I have had some of that in my family too. So you can still find things you're like, oh, I didn't even think of that as a curse, but that kind of is one too, you know, yeah. they may not, they don't have to be like terrible curses, you know, no. it can be little things, just little things that, you know, are odd. Yeah. Just anything that, again, that you're taking out of balance, right? So it has been so lovely to talk to you. I'm so glad that you reached out. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your light with me and like your story. It's so inspirational. It just shows how much you can do in four years of healing, really. Yeah. It's like Thank a complete you. 360. Is there anything else that you wanted to share before we wrap up? Uh, no, not really, but I really appreciate you letting me come on and talk because I might, I want to help as many people as possible. And I, I like how we're so much, we're alike, but we're different. So. Yeah. But we're kind right. of like, helping people with similar things. And we've got like same viewpoints on things, which I love. And you've, you're doing it in that holistic, beautiful way and working with people's like souls, not like, you know, too pushy with things. But, you know, I just think bringing it from that care, self-love perspective is just so incredible. And you've just got such a, a, a fabulous story, especially I know people now that are struggling with addiction and they just almost feel like it's that, that almost like they just want to give up suicide seems like a more of an easier option than recovery so people like yourself and your story is so important because it shows that actually it you did it you did it so quickly in in all honesty you know and that it is possible when you go all in which is so beautiful so I just know you're going to help so many people so thank you so much for sharing your story with me
all right thank you and there we have it guys an episode completed i hope you enjoyed it and it raised a load of awareness in your mind there was alarm bells going you were all like ding that's totally me because that's what i was like when i started this journey and that is the start of the process finding out this information and realizing it has happened in your own life so i really hope it was helpful and before the next episode coming out next wednesday be sure to check us out on instagram so it's hearts underscore underscore happiness also we have a youtube channel where i share the videos i create for instagram on so you can check that out they come on about once a week and then we also have a facebook group if you want to join to carry on the conversation i want to create a community where we're all talking about our very real experiences and traumas and then there is also my website called heartshappiness.co.uk which you can check out to join our mailing list so that as i create new services and support tools for you all you're the first to find out and i have a freebie on there so definitely check that out it's five books that transformed my healing so if you really want to kickstart and you know you're liking the content in here these books are like the basis of so much of my knowledge so definitely check that out and i will speak to you next week i'm so excited to continue this journey with you to help you to find your own heart's happiness take care